Welcome to Three, a part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm Gil Gross with Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. It is so good to be back. Uh, we have not gotten together since the conclusion of the Australian Open, and we're going to have um, all three in this show. We'll have Djokovic, Federer, and Nadal. Um, Nadal, we'll look at his season outlook. He pulled out of Doha. He's getting ready for this Netflix exhibition in Las Vegas. Roger Federer, it's media news. There's a documentary coming out. So we'll get to that at the end and discuss what to expect out of this upcoming Federer documentary, uh, which is coming out sooner than later, around uh, around Wimbledon time this year. But let's start with Novak Djokovic. So I want to talk about kind of his his outlook for the rest of the year, just considering what we saw at the Australian Open with the semifinal loss to Yannick Sinner. Obviously, it's been so long, we're not going to get in the weeds and dissect that semifinal at this point. But um, obviously, separate from everything that Sinner did well, Djokovic called it the worst performance, uh, one of the worst performances uh, of his career in a slam. Uh, so, Amy, I want to ask you just uh, what is the level of concern stemming from that performance as we move forward into the Sunshine Double? I'm not concerned. He had had a brilliant tournament up until that point, and he's a human being. Everybody has a bad match, and the the way that rivalries, the really one, the really great ones, are built. Um, there's some push pull. There's some back and forth. Maybe one player figures out another player, and then the other player has to respond. It's a it's a chess move. So if you keep age out of it which i know is really hard to do this could be just another chapter in their rivalry yeah i would agree with that i just think uh you know he was outplayed in that one match but uh i don't know i'm excited to see more of what's to come from novak he had such a great 2023 and uh sinner obviously in ascent just like i guess just like alcaraz was at wimbledon so now we're going to see what's to come of these uh these young greats I'm not concerned because this is an outlier. Like any any scientific or data driven look at at what this is is going to come to the same conclusion. You can freak out about the age thing, but if you if you're just going to freak out about the age thing, then well, maybe you would have freaked out after Wimbledon last year or with Nadal and Federer we saw throughout their career, these guys hit a certain age and then they're not allowed to lose without the narrative being like, is this the start of the great decline? Uh, but in reality, yeah, he did just have an incredible 2023 season, like unbelievable. And not only that, he finished off the season incredibly strong. And now he's lost the Australian Open in the following year. That's a blip in the radar. Uh, now, obviously, the majors are significant, but how are you going to hit like a high level of panic after the season he just had after one tournament in 2024? It's beyond me uh, how how you could get to a high level of panic, but it's it's the age thing that brings people there. It wasn't even a bad tournament. It was just a bad match. I thought he was below his level for for a lot of it with the just with the illness stuff in the beginning. Popper and had a okay. point to go up two sets. Well, he had four set points to go up two sets to one. Um, and then Prismich got him in a set as well. But it looked like he was rounding into form. Um, and, yeah. you know, that yeah. I think coming into that semifinal, uh, he was coming off of the round of 16 match where he smoked Adrian Manorino. And then Fritz in the last two sets was, was really, really high quality, 6-2, 6-3. Um, after Taylor had the great start. So y you felt pretty good about Djokovic's level heading into the semifinal, but then, you know, he, he threw in a, a a clunker, right? It happens every every well, four or five played. years. No, he got outplayed. He just got outplayed by a guy. And again, I think the tricky thing with a young player like a sinner, as we saw with Alcaraz, is you don't know what the ceiling is. So it's playing against someone like that. Is he dangerous? Is he good? Is he erratic? What's going on out here? You, you don't quite know what his thing is because Sinner's improvement is going like this over the last year. And so we don't know what that means. I remember, I mean, I'm going to go back many, many years when the young Pete Sampras played Yvonne Lendl in the quarterfinals of the U.S. Open. And so like the grand blossoming of Pete Sampras suddenly. And now all this stuff that's been 
talked about sort of like a sinner or a different playing style, but all coming together right here, right here in front of us. And that's what, and that's what sinner did over those last two rounds in Australia this year. Well, that's actually another aspect to it is the head to head, right? Sinner has now won three out of their last four. It's rare that ever happens to Novak Djokovic since 2011 that I don't know that anybody's won three out of four on a stretch. Um, but I, I think that has also gotten people thinking like, is Yannick a, is Yannick a massive roadblock now? Is there a, a head to head issue? Amy, like, do you see anything in that matchup other than Sinner? I mean, Sinner's just played incredible tennis in the last six months and he's improved as a, as a player, not just against Novak, but against everybody. What do you make of the, the current state of the Djokovic versus Sinner head to head? I think Sinner has learned a lot by playing Djokovic and by watching him. Um, his serve is much improved and his net game is much improved. And and getting to the point where it's on par with Novak's. Um, so, you know, I, I think some of it will come down to um, scouting tendencies, you know, situationally, where will um, Novak serve on 40-15, you know, um, that kind of thing. But I do think that confidence is, as much as I like to talk about specifics of the matchup, I, I do think confidence is a thing because as Novak gets older, he's age, the age thing is going to be in the back of his mind. Um, but if there's anybody who can overcome that because of his mental strength and acuity, I think it's Novak and he'll, he'll just have to meditate on this. And, um, you know, within the rivalry, I think he'll have multiple opportunities to regain his confidence. And I would call Sinner, I heard you use the word massive. I would say sig currently significant, it's not roadblock, significant rival. I mean, he's beaten him three of the last four times, including most recently. He, and I also beat him in some significant events too. He beat him at Davis Cup and he beat him at, uh, at, a, at a major. So this wasn't a lower tier event, but I won't upgrade him. I won't upgrade him to massive until he beats Novak in a second major. That's the way yeah. I look. And that is not a roadblock as much as like, wait a second. Here he is. And in a, and just like the way Novak, I think, I don't think he viewed Alcaraz as a massive roadblock or something. He views him as a guy who beat me that time at Wimbledon, who I beat two more times in 2023, including an incredible, one of the great two out of three set matches you'll ever see was that Cincinnati final. I do think that Sinner has reached the point of well-roundedness uh, that makes it difficult for Djokovic to really pick on any one part of the game and like he'll he'll snuff that out right against everybody Novak is able to execute basically whatever tactic there that exists in this sport and if it's if he's playing Medvedev and he needs to serve in volley great if he's playing Tsitsipas and he needs to figure out ways to uh get him running into that backhand cool if he's playing rude and he needs to come forward and make Casper hit backhand passing shots great I do think Sinner has, at the very least, even Alcaraz, I want to throw in here in that list. If we want to be more consistent and outserve him and rush the forehand as much as possible, cool. You don't really know what to do against Sinner right now. Similar yeah. to, you don't really know what to do against Djokovic, and that's one of that's why he's had so much success. But now that Yannick's forehand is consistent and he serves well and he's physical and he moves well, it's tough to. You almost have to go out there and just be like, I got to outplay him, but there's no like great way to beat him. No, he's really good. And he's, and he's got a kind of narrow, but he's broadened and he's improved things. And he, we've all seen the work he's put into things like his serve and learning to move forward better. And obviously the influence of his, his coaches, including Darren Cahill and he's, and he's just getting comfortable. You've just seen, I mean, the, the ascent to a semi and, uh, and to winning one. So that's what's going to be. It's going to be fun to watch Sinner through the next six months, right? To see where things go for him all the way, probably through till well for the year. One hundred percent. He is uh, thirty-two and two since the U.S. Open. Uh, four titles in seven events. One of them was a withdrawal, which is why he has uh, 
he's lost three events, but he only has two losses on his record. Uh, and he's up to number three in the world now. So uh, hopefully we see him play once in the Sunshine Double. My hunch is that we will see that once, either in, at, at Indian Wells or Miami. Let's see. Uh, let us go on now to Rafa Nadal. After Brisbane, he had the micro tear, said it wasn't severe, said it wasn't bad news for the season, no reason to panic, but I can't play the Australian Open. A couple weeks, I want to say, a couple weeks later, we find out Doha's on the schedule. We're going to play Doha. Prior to Doha, it's another withdrawal announcement, this time with not a lot of medical detail, which Rafa had you know, been providing, but this time he just says, quote, I am not ready to compete, and we don't get that detail. Um, I, I, I got to say, like, when it, it's reached the point of setbacks, withdrawals, can't play this, can't play that, where my confidence in Nadal's body holding up, it's gone down, and I'm talking for 2024, it's gone down quite a bit now, Joel, and, and I am, I'm worried that Rafa's not going to be able to play as much tennis this year as he wants to. I agree with you. I just, uh, I wrote this in January, particularly when he pulled out of Australia and he said he was going to be in Doha and that didn't happen. It's kind of like, okay, minute to minute. It's almost like we got to enjoy him. It's like the way he plays one point at a time and just see how it can be. And each match, not, not that every match is going to be his last match. I don't know how that, I mean, I don't know these, it's, it's so different how you can navigate your career in an individual sport. Um, I mean, he could come back and he could come back in 2026 for all we know, right? Whatever. But uh, I know it's really frustrating for everyone who so loves watching Nadal play and seeing quite what's going on in that body and a lot, so much of this wear and tear and training and practice. I do think though, I knew he was going to play a hardcore tournament before the clay. I didn't think he was ever going to, just because he wants to point towards the French doesn't mean he was going to just jettison parts of the sunshine double and Indian Wells is the one he likes most. And uh, there we have it. So hopefully and we'll see, we've got this, got this exhibition in Las Vegas on Sunday. So hopefully that'll go come off. It's ironic that, Alcaraz is the one that's really questionable for it. Apparently there's a, there's a pretty good piece in the athletic and it was the gist of it was sort of like, um, wait, uh, Nadal is doing what now he's, he's coming to the United States. He's going to play an exhibition and in Indian Wells. Really? Um, of course, you know, just like you said, Joel, um, he probably wasn't going to leave that on the table and he's been out on the golf course you know, with Larry Ellison or friends playing uh, 18 holes of golf a day. So he can't be feeling that bad. He is set to play this exhibition. And, you know, we know that Nadal just likes to compete. So if he is fit and healthy, he'll do it. And if he's not, then he won't. In Las Vegas is quite close to Indian Wells. So yeah. that's fine. I, I suspect it will not be a, um, what you, a commercial flight. Uh, yeah 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 the, the how much the, these guys are getting paid for this is undisclosed but uh you gotta imagine that it's it's pretty good netflix money is endless there's a media <laughs> there's a media story there that would be the kind of thing that we wouldn't discuss on this podcast but we discuss off air um but just quickly getting back to nadal like i i do also think there's this weird dynamic because the concern is about his body, his ability to just get out on court healthy and play. But if he is playing, again, you go back to Brisbane, the level was impressive. I still think that as long as he's playing, he's going to be doing quite a fair bit of winning. It's just a matter of, can he get out there? Uh, but don't you also kind of think about this this feedback loop where if he's playing he's winning and then if he's winning he's playing more and if he's playing more then he's more likely to just get injured again ah uh, well then I, that's a that's a potential yes that's a potential feedback loop 
that's part of the Nadal. You know, we've been seeing this for almost 20 years, right? Since the foot right. injury when he was a teenager, right? The, the, and that's why he's the Sisyphus of tennis, up and down and this, right? And now more than ever, because of the stage he's at in his life and his body and all the miles, right? Yeah, and if I could jump There's in, because th that was a very weird, a weird pretzel statement that I just made. I, I'm talking about that in regards to Nadal finishing off his career the way he wants to, right? Like on his own, right out on court. And Joel, I know you have thoughts on this, but it, it's almost as if it's really even harder to find that proper ending because winning gives you hope to play on, but playing on increases the likelihood that you actually, it actually ends up being injury that ends your career and not, uh, okay, I'm good. This is a, this is it now. I'm, I'm ending by playing a match. There are no, here's a term. There are no terms. There are no your terms. There are no their terms. There's no, as you want it. We all live on our terms. We all don't live on our terms. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like some motivational Yoda, whatever the hell, but I just think the whole, that, that is a, I would call that a consumer imposed desire to see such ending. Like, like we've all seen our share of movies, TV shows, and occasionally in sports, those moments, because they mostly don't happen that way in sports as they never happen in life. So I, I think, uh, sorry to jump in. I, I think Gil, that you are assuming that that is the end goal to end on his terms. Maybe he doesn't care how it ends you know maybe it just ends how it ends and um he said he said he doesn't want to end his career in a press conference well he doesn't have to end it in a press conference but isn't he the type of guy that there's a match to, in front of him his goal is to win that match is the hey. ultimate goal to end on my turn okay i guess no but i guess what i'm saying is he's not gonna do of Venus Williams, for example, or I don't know if Venus is even a good example because she continues Andy to Murray. play because she likes it. I guess a Murray. My point is like, let me let me think of a better example. Like this happened a little bit to Isner. Um, but some some players. What I'm saying is some players are told that it's the end because they can no longer win, and I actually don't think I think Nadal is too skilled for that to happen. I either think, I think he's either in a state of having quite a bit of success winning or he's injured. And I, I think those are the only two modes. I don't think there's, he's playing, but he can't win. And by the way, Federer was the same because as much as we like to go, oh, Roger, he lost 6-0 to Hercotch in the, in the quarters in on one knee. And yeah, he was on one knee. It's like, Hello, he was in the quarters. And then at Roland Garros, he won three matches a couple weeks back. And then if you go back before then, he was in the Australian Open semifinal when he had his previous injury. Roger never got to a place where he wasn't winning tennis matches. It never happened. It, it just got to a place where his body okay. said no. Okay. Well, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a mix of body and results. And I just think that, I mean, I, I just, yeah, you're right. I, I definitely do have a point. I think that whole term on your terms. I don't think you play on your, I guess technically we all do and we all don't. What does that mean, your terms? But really, I mean, I, I just hear it I, like, you know? I know, I know, everybody says it and what does it mean? I, crap. I just I think- have a term and I hope I hope I never use it in, in writing ever, but I do use <laughs> it. Okay, got it. But I let, let me put it more literally then. I just think Rafa would like it, the end of his career to be, uh, deciding that it's his last tournament and then playing a tennis match, not I'm injured again. Okay. That's it. You know, he, okay. All right. So he may, but I mean, he would decide beforehand, this will be my last tournament. And when I, when I exit this tournament on my feet, I can then say, I can then say, you know, I don't know. And I think for all of them problem, it's so Personal, you know, I, I noticed there's a lot of, there's always a lot of dialogue about the Pete Sampras thing, but recall Pete Sampras did not play that match and retire that minute. He made, he didn't say this in months later. I think it happens in all their different ways for all of them, their body, their psyche, their family, their desires to, 
the desires to um spend time with other people who even their boredom of travel all sorts of things yeah well if if labor cup didn't exist then what would it have looked like for Federer? But the point is everybody wants to have the, the, uh, it, Pete, Pete is different. I mean, Pete's one everybody, of a kind, by right? Everybody, by everybody, not, you mean every player, everybody, not, you mean every fan? Not, not everybody. Well, first every fan, yes. 90% of players want some sort of fanfare, uh, where, where they can have a moment, I think, to accept the end in a, in a positive way. Uh, where where they that they can feel good about that's, that's why that's, that's why that's Roger good. that's why Roger uh, went to play you know a, the the Labor Cup thing was great but he he did the Labor Cup thing for a reason he didn't just say okay that's it but the 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 decisions about that that's attitudinal that's circumstantial you can you can make your attitude you can apply your attitude to any circumstance you could you could break your leg running down a drop shot be carted off and say, so be it. I left blood out there and I'm being carted off the court and th my career has ended. Or you, <laughs> or you can say, I just lost to, um, Brian Gottfried played his last slam match versus his longtime buddy, Jimmy Connors. And he lost and he jumped the net over and Connors said, what are you doing? Why are you jumping the net? You just, I just beat you. It's, it's my last slam match. And it's like, we can all, we can all, it's the attitude, not the circumstances. I think I'm a little with Joel on this. I think the Labor Cup thing is a bad example because Roger Federer wasn't really a doubles player. And he, he just, that was more of a ceremony than it was an actual match or way to go out. You know, that that was just a chance to give fans and, and, uh, a, a good video and a good goodbye and a good memories and stuff like that. But it wasn't really how his career ended. You know what I mean? Because it was a doubles match with Rafa. Um, where it ended was that last singles match at Wimbledon. And and that was really the end of his career. Well, okay, f fair enough. But I'm actually saying you're, one of my points is also that Rafa is going to be similar to that, uh, the, the way things are trending, where it's either winning or injuries. Um, but anyway, I think we've I think we've exhausted it. Um, We've drifted yeah, well, far afield. I like the uh, I like the <laughs> federologist. Yeah, what what would the federologist think of how Federer? The question, just one last question on this, and we can then say sure. better. How did how did Roger did Roger Federer truly end his career at Wimbledon or at um yeah or at Labor Cup? I think it's kind of fun to think about. It. I like that. I like the way you described it, Amy. It's kind of like a a ceremonial coda. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, but it was, it was very nice. We're all glad it happened, right? Oh, I love. Oh, his, his yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah, it certainly went out on my terms. <laughs> I am glad. <laughs> I am glad that the Netflix exhibition um, is happening. Uh, knock on mm -hmm. wood. Fingers crossed that it actually does happen because um, I. I feel like it's important or it's going to be really nice. It's going to be really nice to see Nadal and Alcaraz share the court. There's a passing of the torch. I mean, we are not, you know, we're not in Spain. We don't have that like Spanish tennis mindset, but I, I do think there's, there's a significance there of some sort of like, let's make sure that this happens, that we have Nadal and Alcaraz share a tennis court together uh, be, before Rafa says goodbye. And I think that's going to be really nice. So much so that I am going and I'd like to, I didn't say that off oh, air, oh, announcing oh, this did. on the show. Oh, I see. That's why you, that's why you're so glad to be going to it. Right. Well, as opposed to a pre Indian Wells Sunday afternoon practice session, we're going to see an exhibition and see Great. That's, that's fantastic. You're going to, you'll be able to give us a report. And, um, you know, if, if Alcaraz can't go, how about Novak? Get him in there. Why not? They're they're taking planes together and posting about it on social media. So why not? No, no. I I thought you were about to say if Alcaraz can't and you want people to have the whole Spanish approach and understand the grinding and the hard work of Spain. Why if Alcaraz can make it, why not Gil? Rafa, <laughs> Gil, you Gil, you 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 like lefties. You're good. You got you got. You're good. I'll bring my rackets. I'll bring my yeah, rackets. No, no, no. Bring your rackets. Yeah. Make sure you string them a little, a little tighter for Las Vegas. That's Good all. advice. Stay hydrated. Yeah. Stay hydrated. Have fun.
I might need the extra tension for the pace coming in as well. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And the and the top spin. Yeah, good. I, I have no idea what to expect. Uh, it's it's uncharted territory. It's being put on by Netflix. It's at Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. Haven't been to Vegas since I was like 10 years old. Uh, it's a pretty different experience being in Vegas when you're 10 uh, versus when you're in your mid-20s. So there's that. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of an undercard. Uh, Fritz Tiafo, Sam Query, John Isner, they're all going to be there. I, I think one of the Brian bros... If not both, I'm not. I think Bob. I think Bob. Bob. Yeah. Yeah, think- yeah. So, I mean, again, I'm kind of going into it pretty, pretty blind. Um, I'm, I'm going basically through Monday match analysis and I'm, I'm going to experience it and to report back uh, and, and to talk about it on the podcast. We'll see if I, you know, get any, any interview content done or any kind of cool footage, but Really, it's going over there to experience it. What what should be a pretty special and, and unique event, and um, just seeing what happens from there. Enjoy, enjoy. We'll want to know all about it. See if you can get a question in to Rafa if you get media availability. You know, I don't know if, and I know this sounds crazy. I'm not sure they're going to be made available. Yeah, I think there might be one phenomena. I. I... We could talk. We'll talk about it offline. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not positive about that. I think Netflix might obviously they're gonna talk to the players in some capacity. I just wonder if there's gonna be some on broadcast Netflix exclusivity there and uh us credentialed media are not going to be able to to chat with them. We'll see what happens. Uh speaking of entertainment, Federer documentary. Uh the only thing I don't have written down in my notes is what what platform it's being Amazon. released on. Okay, Amazon. Amazon. Thank you. Um, so this doc is going to focus on the last 12 days leading up to Laver Cup. Roger had the idea to start the doc. He went to his good friend and very big tennis fan, Anna Wintour. And uh, Anna Wintour hooked him up with the necessary connections to make this happen. So... It was literally Roger's idea. It is supposed to be released around Wimbledon. And one other note I want to leave you with, Amy. Mirka Federer gave her first interview in over a decade for the making of this documentary. How excited are you for this? Yeah. I I, I mean, um, it's a trend in documentaries right now where the athlete is backing the documentary so from a a purist standpoint um this will have roger's stamp of approval but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be some absolutely golden footage in there and and emotional moments and um i can't wait to see it um, I, agree. I, agree. I don't think it's going to win an oscar but it, it it should be really good for federer fans Definitely not neutral about it. Um, yeah, I definitely am excited to see it. And it's uh, just to see Roger. I mean, yeah, these things, well, a lot of this created, I guess it's Roger's last dance. <laughs> it's like sort of, he's the guy, um, you know, he wanted to make it happen. And it's going to, it's obviously going to be a lot of the things he wants to show in it, but it's fun. I mean, it's something, and I, I saw recently this tweet of Roger hitting on a backboard, just Roger himself commands curiosity. What's he saying? What's he thinking? How is he feeling? How do people react to him? That's interesting too. How they how they connect with him. He's sort of this. He's like the James Bond Beatles of tennis. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a Last Dance, but it's also kind of not because it's so focused, right? It's not, which I'm really happy about because there has been. And Amy, you alluded to the kind of player directed doc that ends up being almost like just it becomes a nostalgia booster, but you don't mm-hmm. learn anything. Right. And there's not a lot of honesty in a lot of these pieces. It, it's like, it's almost like you could, could have gone on YouTube and just looked up the, the highlights and gotten like a similar rush of nostalgia and uh, dopamine. But what I, what I really like about this is it actually has like a focus. 
it's the 12 days leading up to this massive labor cup goodbye. And I think what, what we're going to end up seeing a lot of is how the tennis community and Roger, uh, basically how Roger does the rounds and says goodbye and says thank you to everybody in the tennis community and vice versa. Because I imagine that's what the 12 days leading up to that were mostly about. That's a great production question because in a way you could, if you organize that story, you could do it as literally the occurrences over those 12 days, or you could do what I call kind of the micro history. We do those 12 days, but you beam in the flashbacks, the cutaways to other moments. So if you're, if you're, if you're shaking hands, you're saying goodbye to, and you bump into Mark Philippoussis, do you juxtapose the image of him playing Mark Philippoussis in the 03 Wimbledon final? You know what I mean? I, re I read this great book once on John Kennedy's inaugural address and the course of it, they touched on his whole life because they used that as a launching pad. So it'd be interesting. I'm fascinated to see how that does. One thing this does though, is show you Rogers. No, see, this is how I ended my career. Sorry, you guys. No, my career did not end when I lost at Wimbledon 6-0 in the fourth set. My career ended when I had these 12 days and then this grand thing at Labor Cup. So it is this kind of like what... Uh, and I don't blame the athletes. If I was an athlete, I'd want to do it too. Self-created narrative construction. Winston Churchill, he said once, uh, history will be kind to me, for I shall write it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what these, that, that's what that, these athlete things are. That would be, um, if you took, you know, if you took these 12 days and then you used it to flashback to tell the, the story of his entire career, that would be more the last dance um, mold or formula. Some of the moments, um, in his career. not the entire career, but some, yeah, certain, yeah, certain notable things like, yeah, it, it's different than Last Dance, though, because Last Dance was not purely Michael Jordan's vehicle. There were other producers and players that kind of approached Jordan and said, Would you do this? Would you sit for an interview? Um, and and so he was but one piece of the puzzle. This is something that was Federer's idea and he backed it and he took it to Anna Wintour, his friend and said, I'm the executive producer of this and I'm going to see this through. So he, he'll have final cut on everything. Um, but it, it, for nostalgia buffs and you know, there's going to be some tears. Um, it's going to be really cool to see it. Well, also yeah. it wasn't last dance. They didn't know how that season was going to end when they shot when they, when they last dance that Michael Jordan they were shooting a season, right? Y With yes. Well, r right. Uh, they, they did, that they did, that, that not, final they right that final season they offered unprecedented camera access to the Bulls season, which by the way Federer has. Uh, it, it also came out in the public information about this documentary. He let the camera crews in his house. He let the camera crews in his hotel. So. You know, that was kind of, I think, part of, I don't know how how hands-on Roger will really feel or, or really felt the need to be in terms of like, I, I, I want to talk about this and I want the documentary to cover that. I think it was really about like, hey, like, let's make sure we just get all of this that's happening in these 12 I days. I want to go back to Last Dance. Um, the, the, better, the last 12 days before I finished my career playing an, an exhibition playing doubles. It's a different thing than Last Dance, where it's like you're in for a season, and we don't know how this season is gonna. Yes. Yeah. And had Jordan even announced that that was going to be his last season, or did he only pull the cord? He didn't because only he didn't... no, <laughs> only pulled the cord. Yeah. So it's and and then so many years have passed since then. You know, we now have the retrospective or the um, hindsight to realize that was the last dance now. Um, and, and that, you know, with Federer, it was all predetermined. Like it's for the Bulls, the last dance. well, wait, wait, for the Bulls, it was the last dance. Well, that's true. Oh, no. They no, no, knew wait, that wait at the time. They knew that at the time. They did know that at the time, but it's a different thing. I think when you permit a cinema verite um, season long access to a sports team and flux that's competing in real games, than a single sport athlete saying this will be my, this is my yep. dance 12 days prior to the event that i own but yep. gil to your point about you know roger just let the cameras in and then he just kind of lived his life that's true but as we three know um it's really about the edit <laughs> 
and like who has final say over the edit and you know um if if i were um had final cut over something about my life i would only want to show certain parts and maybe not other parts and it's just something for yeah. viewers to keep in mind no t totally agree I, I i would just say like if if federer were doing uh the 2011 us open semi-final uh against novak and that were the documentary he might have a little bit more to say about what how that's portrayed uh, the, the events of that and how it's portrayed versus this which it's like okay like it's not like uh you know basically it's it's not gonna be an example where uh like with michael jordan's gambling for example where it's something that could easily be portrayed as like a very negative thing or as like something that is maybe less negative or portrayed more positively but yeah it's definitely the buck will stop with roger it is a good thing to keep in mind i agree all right uh well lots to look forward to in that case again that that documentary they haven't set a date but it's going to come around uh come out around wimbledon time i'm sure we'll talk about it at that point uh indian wells draw will be coming up next week and we will talk to you then that'll do it for this episode of three remember we're available on all podcast platforms and if you're watching on youtube like comment and subscribe we will see you next time on the next episode of three